big cup and hello welcome back to the gilmore away podcast i'm kate and i'm laura and welcome to the first substantive episode of the podcast we dropped our very first episode two weeks ago but that was just a quick introductory episode giving some background on us our interest in the show and how we envision the podcast moving forward um, and then last week, we also released an entire episode outlining our full road trip through New England, going to all the Gilmore Girls hotspots that we were dying to see, uh, our road trip to Harvard, essentially. Uh, so go check those out if you haven't already, and you're curious to know more about us. Um, and we're going to jump in to our first actual episode here. So what we're going to do is we're just going to summarize the episodes real quick, and then sort of lead into the conversation. Today, we're going to talk about the pressures on gifted students. But before we get started, just a reminder to do those youtube -y things, like, subscribe, comment, share, everything helps. Um, so yeah. Yep. Uh, we would also like to remind you that this is a spoilers all podcast. We will be talking and covering about everything that happens in this show. It is fair game. Uh, this show has been on the air long enough. The main series ended 15 years ago. The reboot was six years ago. So you've had plenty of time to watch it. And if you haven't, please go do so. Um, we're going to be, again, going over the episodes uh, at the beginning of each episode briefly, just as a refresher and to set the course for our found, um for what we're going to be talking about. Um, but we're assuming that anyone who's watching has a certain level of knowledge about the show on the whole, so we won't be going over too many things repetitively that you don't already know. Yeah, so before we get started, actually, I just did want to point out my I Smell Snow mug. Today was the first snow here, so this felt super appropriate, and it is now half full of coffee because coffee is it is Yes, it is. <laughs> That's very fitting. Yeah, so I just thought I should mention that. But mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into the pilot. So obviously the pilot sets the stage for the show and it introduces us to our main characters. So we have Lorelai and Rory, Richard and Emily, and then we get the secondary characters of Luke, Suki, Lane, Dean, Michelle, and, you know, the charming and quirky town of Stars Hollow, which feels like a character in itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so we get the inciting incident of the whole show, which is Rory's acceptance into Chilton, a fancy prep school in Hartford, which Lorelai and Rory consider to be the first step to achieving Rory's dream of going to Harvard. Um, so but there's a hitch in the plan. Lorelai can't afford the tuition for Chilton and the enrollment free, sorry, enrollment fee <laughs> up front. So in order to secure the money in time, she has to approach her estranged rich parents for a loan. They agree to loan her the money, but the caveat to this loan is that Lorelai and Rory have to attend dinners at the Elder Gilmore's every Friday night and give updates on Rory's school and their lives. Meanwhile, Rory meets Dean, the new kid at Stars Hollow High, and she develops a crush on him, which makes her second guess leaving her current school, which causes conflict with Lorelai, who has now injured her precious pride by going to her parents for money, um, in the belief that Chilton's the best place for Rory. So... At that week's dinner, Rory finds out about the arrangement accidentally as Lorelai and Emily have a screaming match in the kitchen, which is one of the best scenes in the whole show. It's just mm -hmm. beautifully and brilliantly written and acted. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of rehash, you know, the parents' treatment of her and sort of why she left in the first place and why it's so difficult for her to go to them for help now. Um, but overhearing this encourages Rory to follow through with the original plan and she agrees to go to Chilton. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is followed up with the second episode, um, the Lorelai's first day at Chilton. And this uh, episode starts out, we see it's the morning of Rory's first day at her new school. Uh, but unfortunately, she gets started off on the wrong foot because her mother Lorelai's alarm clock, uh, which is furry, one might note, um, does not go off on time. So they are running late and Lorelai ends up bringing Rory to this fancy prep school in a pink tie-dye t-shirt, denim Daisy Dukes, and cowboy boots which we can all agree is very appropriate first day of school wear. Um, iconic. They, yeah. Yes, iconic. Um, they very quickly meet the headmaster, Hanlon Charleston, who admonishes Rory, um, or rather I should say admonishes Lorelai um, about her outfit along with Emily as uh, Miss Gilmore, the reigning matriarch of this household, also showed up to that uh, event. Um, but then we get Hanlon interviewing Rory about her aspirations to go to Harvard, wanting to become a foreign correspondent like Christian Amanpour. 
And we're also introduced to a lot of several new key characters in this episode, Tristan Dugray, Paris Geller, Paris's best friends, Madeline and Louise. And we very quickly see that Paris is likely to be a major thorn in Rory's side because she's so competitive from an academic standpoint. Um, what is relevant to what we're going to be talking about this week is noting that Rory is quickly overwhelmed by the amount of homework that she gets on the first day of school, how much work she's going to be facing, not only to get caught up, but just to survive in this new academ academic um, institution, and not to mention the highly competitive atmosphere that is fostered there. Um, as previously mentioned, Emily tries to put herself into Lorelai and Rory's lives by showing up at the school that morning trying to buy Rory more uniforms, wanting to buy her a parking space, even going to their house to get a DSL line and internet installed. And all in all, we can see that it is a very stressful day for all of the Gilmore girls that ends with double cappuccinos and pizza, which aside from a problematic first day of school, that's a great way to wind down any day. Yeah, that's pretty much the end of most days for me. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah. So how do you feel about these episodes? Like, are they among your favorites or where do they kind of fall for you? I wouldn't say they're among my favorites, but from a starting out standpoint, I think they do a phenomenal job at establishing everything that we need to know about our main characters, Lorelai, Rory, Emily, and Richard. We start seeing why there's tension within the Gilmore household. We don't know the entire backstory of where that tension comes from, but it's there and it's established for us. I think it's great seeing some of these stars hollow characters and some of Rory's schoolmates coming into play and learning more about them. The one caveat and the one thing that I don't really love um, and would be my one bone to pick would just be that we were never really told too much about Rory's father as these first two episodes starts out. Um, we do know um, that Lorelai was a teenage mother. So you can put two and two together. I think it's wrong to necessarily make that assumption, though. So I would have liked the showrunners and the writing to just give us a little more exposition and a little more detail about why he's not in the picture, why he's not in the household, how active of a parent is he. Um, so that's my one minor flaw that I see with it. But other than that, I think uh, character development was really well done here. And uh, it lays the groundwork for everything that we get going forward. What did you think? Right. I mean, you're right about that. We really don't get Christopher until two thirds of the way through this first season. So he's kind of this like enigma up front. And I mean, you know, the single mother thing makes some sense given the, the teen pregnancy, but it would have been nice to know a little bit more about her. Like all we really know is what Richard says at dinner, which we also know later. We, we find out that, you know, it's not the whole picture and that Christopher is not really as successful as Richard's making him out to be. And we just know that, uh, you know, Richard didn't like him so much when he got Lorelai pregnant at 16. So it, it's kind of funny watching the dynamic of Richard lauding Christopher and putting Lorelai down mm -hmm. when Lorelai is the one who stepped up and parented Rory. So that's interesting. Yeah. But um, yeah, uh, Lorelai's first day at Chilton is, it's so hard to rank my favorite episodes of the show, but it's definitely up there because I just love the whole Chilton arc. And this really is the beginning of it. I think there's a lot of really great stuff and it, it really does set up basically everything for the first three seasons and a little mm -hmm. bit beyond that as well yeah, in terms of the relationships and the driving conflicts and the core of these characters and their, their aspirations. So it's really important to the overall show. And it's just sort of that like, nostalgic feeling for me. I was always one of those nerds who loved the first day of school. And so Rory's first day of Chilton and, you know, the new uniform and the whole new rigmarole of the new school. I just, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Holds a strange nostalgia for me, I guess. Understandable. Yeah. Um, what did you think about the fact that obviously the inciting incident of this whole show is that Lorelai finds out that there's a large enrollment fee that she doesn't have the money for up front and that she needs to borrow from Emily and Richard. Yeah. And my question about that is why does Lorelai not know the exact financial breakdown of exactly what she's getting herself into with Chilton? And like, why, why do you think that they did it like this and that Lorelai decided to send her kid to a school that they could barely afford Mm -hmm. And and what does that say also about, you know, socioeconomic status and resources and 
inequalities in the education system? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, my first answer to your first question would be, um, I don't know because I'm perplexed as to why Lorelai didn't do her homework here with what tuition costs at the school were gonna be. The only um, explanation that I think I can provide is just that the writers had to do it this way so that Lorelai would be forced to turn to Emily and Richard for the tuition money needed to secure Rory's spot. But there's no way that as a parent, she should have been going through this application process to this new school with her daughter without knowing exactly what the financial repercussions of that were going to be. So I think it was just written that way to excel the storyline and get it to where we needed to be. But it does say a lot about socioeconomic status, especially with the fact that Lorelai and Rory, um, they had a very easy out here. They had rich parents and grandparents in Rory's case who were immediately willing and able and ready to step in and just cut a check, which that's all it took. You know, Richard has the line where he's just like, yep, I'll get the checkbook. And it's done and Rory's into Chilton. There are so many students who are denied academic privileges, educational opportunities because they don't have the money to be able to afford going to these institutions. And it's a horrendous thing for any student to have to combat that. But Rory's very privileged here. Um, we see that privilege play out throughout the show in so many ways. This is just the first instance of her not having any roadblocks that most students face in this regard. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to be said here for just the inequalities of students not getting the opportunities that should be given to them. So it's a very sad thing to have to endure. But um, yeah, she was lucky with Emily and Richard being there to just give her the money. Um, privilege yeah check your privilege just check the privilege <laughs> a little bit it happens a lot in the show that you know the money kind of swoops in from nowhere and someone steps in as the angel investor in in someone's education and mm -hmm. yeah it just kind of blows my mind i understand the impetus to you know get into the school that you think is going to get your kid where they want to go and do it at an, any cost, whether the cost is financial or just your pride in Lorelai's case, um, or both, <laughs> I guess it's kind of both for her. Um, but it really does sort of highlight the inequalities. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody has the opportunity, the safety net that Lorelai has to be able to make it happen. It just, it blows my mind that she didn't do the research or get all of the information about exactly how much was due and when, and, you know, yeah. had to have that funny conversation with whatever Chilton administrator was on the other end. Where she yeah. Said, it's doesn't, even, doesn't have enough time to pull a bank job. Yeah. It's even more preposterous that had Emily and Richard not been a part of Lorelai's life to step in and, and pay for the tuition here, that there wasn't even a payment plan that could have been worked out for Lorelai with the school. She is questioning whomever she's on the phone with saying, you know, can I just give you part of it just to get her started and I'll give you the rest. And I'm sure Lorelai would have been good for it because she wanted Rory to go to this school and succeed. So she would have paid the money over time. But the fact that there was no compromise even to be given or worked out is just so egregious. And it breaks my heart that uh, Rory was up against this. But this is something that so many students face on a daily basis. It's still a part of the world we live in now that kids are not getting the education that they need or deserve and pursuing what is right for them and what could be good for them, especially when we start getting to those gifted students. And we'll dive into that a little bit more as we move forward. But when they don't have these opportunities to exceed in, succeed in the way that they should be, that's horrendous. There's no acceptable reason why that should be happening. So, yeah, you know, lower income students are at a major disadvantage, um, even when they're sort of you know, intellectually and academically on par with students from higher income brackets. You know, they have a lot more hurdles to mm -hmm. overcome, and are ju they're just not performing at the same level because they can't, they're, they lack the resources to be able to do so. And resources are incredibly important for gifted students because they just, they need certain workarounds for things to enable them to reach their full potential, which kind of is actually a great segue into sort of the definition of giftedness that we're working with here. And so the National Association for Gifted Children has a definition of 
students with gifts and talents perform or have the capability to perform at higher levels compared to others of the same age, experience, and environment in one or more domains. They require modifications to their educational experiences to learn and realize their potential. Mm -hmm. Adverse developmental effects have been noted for gifted students who do not have opportunities uh, for early education or to participate in challenging programs. This is particularly true for those from poverty who underperform when compared to their gifted peers from higher socioeconomic backgrounds and are at greater risk for dropping out of high achieving groups during elementary and secondary school years. Conversely, well-designed programs that challenge and support gifted students, including those from underserved populations, are associated with increased success. Gifted students mm -hmm. need support and guidance to develop socially and emotionally, as well as in their areas of talent. Socio-emotional development may lag intellectual development. Thus, it's crucial that gifted education professionals and, student, and, and parents of students with gifts and talents promote well-rounded development and the pursuit of self-actualization. Further qualities such as emotion regulation, social skills, willingness to take strategic risks, ability to cope with challenges and handle criticism, confidence, self-perceptions, and motivation should be developed as they may differentiate those individuals who move to increasingly higher levels of talent development from those who do not. That was a lot of definition. Sorry for the reading, but nope. I think okay. that sort of like really is important for our understanding of Rory and Paris and Jess, Logan, April, so many characters in this show kind of really fit that definition. And it's so core to Rory's character, her giftedness and her her golden child of it all <laughs> um, mm -hmm. is, is so core to the show. And so I think we really needed to set that foundation and, and give that definition. Mm -hmm. And it's an, it's an important definition, but it's also important to note too that while this is one singular thing that we just laid out here, um, there's not a one size fits all glove with gifted students. I mean, there are so many that could be grouped together and labeled that way and put into a gifted program. I know that both you and I have had our own personal experiences with that, but that doesn't mean that within that gifted program that any student should be just marginalized and generalized and they all should be still rigorously tested in the same way. You still need to break down within that gifted student subset, what does each individual child need and what is going to foster their growth and development the best? And I think that happens, unfortunately, a lot too, where we just lump gifted students together, expecting they're all going to succeed in the same way and need the same things. And they don't, they still need that individualization in terms of what they're going to be best, you know, how they're going to be best educated. Right. And there are different types of presentations of giftedness as well. You know, you have the um, the striving, successful Paris type, you know, which is sort of the, the most commonly thought of version of giftedness where, you know, it's characterized by impressive academic performance, lots of academic achievements, pre prestigious career path choices, um, just excelling in so many areas of their life. And you know, there are a lot of expectations put on those kids, both by parents and themselves. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have the types who are sort of more challenging to authority. They're a little more creative. They they don't fit into that box and they really need something different. They don't conform to our typical ideas of what a gifted child looks like. And then mm -hmm. you get the ones who are, are clearly gifted and talented, but want to necess not necessarily be seen that way. They want to sort of fit in with the regular kids, if you will. And, mm -hmm. and so they sort of like maybe try to underperform to, to fit into the, the larger social group that they want to be a part of. And they need some extra support from parents and teachers. And then there's, you know, the dropout type, which is, you know, we get that in Jess. Um, you know, they're sort of at risk for falling through the cracks because they're so frustrated and bored in regular programs, but they may not have the resources or the support systems to be able to excel like everyone else. And then you get the more autonomous types like Rory, who are driven, self-reliant, uh, you know, teach themselves very well. They love the school setting. They seek out challenges for themselves, they're independent, and 
they have a strong sense of self. And so that giftedness really is a huge part of that. And obviously that's our Rory. So, mm -hmm. you know, th yeah. there's not one box that you can put all these kids into to begin with. And so to sort of mandate something across the board for everyone is not a successful strategy for dealing with giftedness. No. And I even think just let's look at Rory's first day at Chilton and how overwhelmed she immediately gets. Now, Rory is a very bright and gifted student. I don't think anyone would argue that who is watching this show. But she has been going to Stars Hollow High for years where there's been no academic competition from her peers. She hasn't been challenged in the way that she should have been. And she goes into Chilton and you would think that someone as knowledgeable and as smart as she is would just fit right in and success would be immediately something that's achievable and that she just wins at right away, but she doesn't. And I want to go back to um, the interview that she has with Hanlon because there's a great line that he throws at her as he's interviewing her that I want to read aloud because I think it embodies everything that Chilton is going to throw at her, but also the pressure that, again, any gifted student is going to face necessarily. Um, and Hanlon says to her as he's interviewing her, um, Chilton has one of the highest academic standards of any school in America. You may have been the smartest girl at Stars Hollow, but this is a different place. The pressures are greater, the rules are stricter, and the expectations are higher. If you make it through, you will have received one of the finest educations one can get, and there should be no reason why you should not achieve all your goals. However, since you are starting late and you are not used to this highly competitive atmosphere, there is a good chance that you will fail. That is fine. Failure is a part of life, but not a part of Chilton. Understand? Yeah, I take umbrage at that, Charleston. <laughs> Failure is what teaches resilience, which is a huge part of success. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's your first red flag <laughs> about Chilton. But yeah, it it's such an overwhelming experience for her to kind of be grilled like this. She's asked a lot of questions about her life and her activities and all kinds of stuff. And Charleston kind of assumes that her desire to be like Christiane Amanpour has to do with wanting to be on TV. And he, you know, girls are about like, what, you don't want to be like Cokie Roberts or like one of the women on The View. And she's like, no, I just want to, you know, see things and experience things and tell stories basically. And yeah, he just really lays into her on that. And, and she's clearly overwhelmed. And then you see that continue as she goes to speak to Miss James in administration. And uh, <laughs> I want to read this one out because this one's fun. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not strictly necessary, but I'm going to have fun with this. Go for it. Here's your locker number. Here's your schedule. Here's <laughs> the rules of the school in the Chilton Honor Code. Here are the words to the school song, which must be recited upon demand. This can happen anytime, any place. If you do it in Latin, you get extra credit. Do you have any questions? If you do, you can make an appointment with your guidance counselor, Mr. Winters. He handles everything but bulimia and pregnancy. For that, you have to go to the nurse or Coach Rubens. Welcome to Chilton. Yeah, I mean, holy hell. Like, what a lot. Not even from an academic standpoint to just throw at this girl, just but just to just be like, if you're having issues, like go see this person, go see that person. I don't know what to tell you. I'm not going to be able to help you. But like, she's just getting so many, she's not even getting the book thrown at her. She's getting so many different books thrown at her as she's starting. And to have to process all of that and take this all in, when again, this isn't necessarily a standard that she's been used to at Stars Hollow High, it sweeps her off her feet and it completely overwhelms her. And we see she goes back to Lorelai at the end of the day. And the first thing is just she just drops her book bag and just gives her mom a hug because she's so just spent by the day that she's had in so many different ways. That's a lot for any student to process. She handles it as well as she could. But again, these are challenges that so many different students face. Unfortunately, not everyone is going to cope with it in a way that she did. But it's worth noting that, yeah, like even someone as gifted and as smart as Rory is struggling on day one. Yeah. So this whole plaid skirt thing, my idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's a tough day. And I mean, obviously the social aspect plays into that as well, because I too would be super confused going into a new school and having someone call me Mary for no reason. But mm -hmm. oh, yes, yeah, that's, that's just me. But uh, yeah. So, I mean, let's move ahead a little bit, I guess, to mm -hmm. deer hunters, which mm -hmm. is sort of 
the next time we really get to see the stress and pressure of Chilton starting to break Rory a little bit. And obviously, you know, she spends hours upon hours and days upon days studying for her Shakespeare test. She knows her stuff inside out. Lorelai helps her out and she neglects to set her alarm. She oversleeps. She's late for her test. How do you feel about that? Like, do you think Mr. Medina was right and not letting her take that test or take some sort of makeup? I, I actually do think that Mr. Medina was correct here. This may be an unpopular opinion, but I'm going to stand firmly in the camp that he was right to ask her to leave the classroom. She did not show up on time for this test. She was given fair warning when the exam was going to begin. She was given adequate time to go over the study materials and do all of the preparation that was necessary for her. And Chilton has the standards that they have for a reason, which they expect all of the students to adhere to. So you can't just say, oh, I'm sorry that your alarm didn't go off on time. Please sit down. Like, you can still take the test anyway. That's cobbling, and that's not what Chilton is going to do. Hanlon makes that very clear. The educators there make it very clear. And Rory needs to grow up a little bit here and realize that this is how Chilton works. To an extent, it's how the world works. You need to be on time for the responsibilities that are set before you. So yes, I think that Max Medina was absolutely in the right here to say, you cannot take this test. You are not on time. That's the standard we have here. So that's how this is going to go down. Yeah, I would tend to agree. I think Chilton has set these standards and they're in place for a reason. And most of them are understandable, if not entirely reasonable. Um, you know, they have to maintain fairness and decorum and being like allowing one person to take a test when they're late could be a slippery slope and so you know she can have all the excuses of a deer hitting her mom's jeep all she wants but <laughs> you know in chilton's eyes you know it's a slippery slope to chaos and bedlam apparently but mm -hmm. um on the other side of the coin though it does feel a little harsh for them to like never allow for any wiggle room for acts of God, if you will, mm -hmm. it, you know, it just maybe gets a little bit demoralizing when there's no chance to explain or redeem yourself. You know, I've lived in the adult world for over a decade now and, you know, no one ever fires you for being five minutes late. You know, it, there's, there's more wiggle room in the real world than in Chilton. And I understand that they want to instill these habits in their students, but you know, it may not actually be effective as a pedagogical tool to be so rigid and and to set expectations that may not be reasonable in all circumstances and that can actually inhibit their success more than support it if they're feeling demoralized by it. So, I mean, in this case, it really was Rory's fault because... Mm -hmm. If she had managed her time a little bit better or, you know, just made the effort to go to bed, set her alarm, not fall asleep while studying. Like sleep is so important for mm -hmm. the consolidation of memory, especially for teens. Sleep deprivation is a huge problem among students. And maybe she just didn't know this yet, but getting some sleep probably would have been better for her than cramming late and falling asleep mm -hmm. at a 90 degree angle at the kitchen table. So, yeah. you know, in that way, the deer thing is one thing because, you know, there's no accounting for that. That could happen to anyone, anytime. I feel like there should be maybe a little bit of wiggle room for that, but you have to sort of rewind the clock a little bit and remember how that came to be. The fact that I don't even know if she fully has her driver's license yet. And her mom's like, take the keys, take the phone, drive yourself to school because you're going to be late otherwise. And, mm -hmm. you know, she stops to check that Lane has a set of her notes. Weird, but okay. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, it still comes back to some fault on her part for not being a little more organized, not being firm her, sorry, firmer with her own sleep schedule. And, so on this one, I'm like, sorry, Rory, this one's 
your fault. You should take a little more responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. um, the deer thing exacerbated the problem, but you never would yeah. have been in the car to be hit by the deer in the first place if you had just managed yourself a little bit better. Um, and the other thing is, I'm not sure that she really learned from it because in the end, Mr. Medina gave her some extra credit. She moved on, she caught up. And I don't know if she internalized either the lesson of manage yourself better or if um, like, I don't think yeah. she did because yeah, she just, continues, she continues to slip up sometimes and she still expects handouts and for the world to cater to her mistakes when they're of her own doing. Um, I will say going back to should Chilton make allowances and exceptions for acts of God and extenuating circumstances, I think they probably would have. But I think what was also coming into play here was that Rory entered into that classroom frantically knowing that she was late when her peers were in the midst of what is a very crucial and important test to them. Um, that is a significant portion of their grade, as indicated. Um, and she was having a sort of mini meltdown, which is, again, just disruptive to her peers. So I think it was also Max just wanting to remove her from the classroom so that the other students could continue to take their pest test in relative peace, so to say. Mm -hmm. But I do think that he would have been willing to step outside and at least hear her out in terms of what's going on. The result may have been the same in terms of, no, you still can't take this test. But I think it was just more of, let's also get you out of this classroom in this moment. Yeah. I mean, she explained the deer thing and yet he still had to take her to Headmaster Charleston, probably for the freak out. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, he didn't seem to have any leeway or wiggle room to be able to, um, you know, accommodate for this unusual circumstance where, you know, granted, if she had left on time, this wouldn't have been a problem. She mm -hmm. wouldn't have been cutting it to such a razor's edge. But okay, I think what I was trying to get at before, it was like, the lesson is not, you can never be late for anything. I don't think that's the grand lesson that Rory should be taking away from the standard that Chilton set. But the, the lesson really should be that like, when you push yourself too hard like that, it's going to be worse for you in the end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to learn those self-management skills. So it's not a, just about being extremely punctual. It's about the self-management that leads to that punctuality, I think. And maybe Chilton would do better to actually emphasize that instead of just the rigid standards. And if they taught those skills a little better, mm -hmm. that might help. But, you know, Rory also had to learn that she wasn't exceptional just because something bad happened to her and that, you know, sometimes excuses aren't enough. But speaking of excuses, like, what do you think of Charleston's reaction and Lorelai's subsequent blow up in his office? Um, Lorelai was definitely a mother hen here. And I get that. That's your child. You want to be protective and see them succeed and go to bat for them in any way that you can. But I think she was also a bit too explosive in nature with how she was trying to defend Rory. And I think this largely stems from a place of privilege where she expects Rory to succeed and get what she needs from this institution to succeed. That's being denied to her in this moment. At least that's how they're taking it. So Lorelai and Rory are both not understanding of where Headmaster Charleston is coming from. Now, I mean, there's also a very, you know, hilarious moment that happens where they refer to the headmaster as El Duce. Um, <laughs> this rotting, stodgy rat nest as yeah. well for the school overall. That's a great line. Yeah. Uh, so obviously we know how they feel about uh, Charleston on the whole, but he's just, again, Charleston has ethics and, and a standards and a code by which they, you know, run their school. So he's just upholding that. Um, he may have been a little blunt and a little bit harsh with how he approached the Gilmore women with his response and his decision. But again, I really, I support his decision here to not let her take the test. Um, and I think it's even generous that they were able to work out an agreement where Rory's able to do extra credit to make up for it. I have to go back to what you said too. This was Rory's error. She mismanaged her time. She overslept. She, this is her own fault. And she's gracious enough to be given the reprieve that she is in terms of that extra credit. But I support what went on in Charleston's office as well. So what do you think? Yeah, I think he was a little bit glib with the whole, 
you know, the dog ate my homework or, you know, the list of excuses. It just sounds condescending. Um, but the sentiment stands, you know, you have to maintain the standards. You have to prevent students from lapsing into just constantly coming up with reasons why they can't do things. Right. So understandable. Um, not Lorelai's shining moment. <laughs> nope, but she's not. She's not doing much to impress Hanlon at this point. <laughs> no, um, yeah, I, they're just they're not used to this. They're used to Rory being the golden child and getting whatever she wants and everything being hunky dory. And so, you know, for them to come up against a challenge like this, it's it, I think it's new for them. They haven't really faced this before. Mm -hmm. But um, shortly after this, uh, can I transition us to one more? Uh, oh, not yet. I have like one more point on this. Okay. But like the next scene where they're sort of driving home and they're having a conversation about whether well, Chilton is the right place for her. That is a good parenting moment from Lorelai. Her blow up was not a good look. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, her, her support of Rory after she gets the D and, you know, sort of acknowledging it, but helping Rory move past it and saying like, Look, you yeah. got a D, but you will catch up. I will help you. We will do what it takes to pass this test and to, to help her through that. And then to also come back at the end and say, if this isn't for you, if it's too much stress or pressure, you know, you don't have to do it. I'm not going to make you do this. You have to want to be there. You have to want to put in this work. You have to be able to manage the stress and not let it get to you. And if you can't, it's going to change who you are. You love to learn. Well, she's not, obviously I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> like Rory loves to learn and Lorelai knows this and she doesn't want anything to demoralize Rory to the point that she'll just give up. And so she's very supportive in that moment. And that I think is one of her, her maybe top 10 parenting moments. So mm -hmm. I haven't actually made that list. Maybe someday I'll make that list, but I think yeah. it's probably up there because it just is one of those moments where she's so understanding no matter how long they've prepped for this and how hard they've worked for Chilton, if it's not right for Rory, she's not going to force her to do it. Mm -hmm. And I respect that. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of leaning towards like a similar moment where we see, we have like a scene where Rory's not allowed to take a test, but we also have a scene um, with her at Chilton early on where she receives a paperback with that D grade on it. And mm -hmm. that's kind of also what I wanted to talk about that you just touched upon where her teacher, Max Medina, plops this paper down in front of her. And, you know, he's talking to the class in general. And he says, you know, great effort by some, good effort by most. You know, some of you are going to need a little bit more work here. And he says that specifically as he puts Rory's paper down in front of her. And then he makes eye contact her and says, you know, take this home, learn from your mistakes, essentially do better. And he's not too subtly singling her out in front of the entire class that perhaps her paper was subpar and that she just got a poor grade. And we instantly see Paris, Madeline and Louise be questioning her about it, knowing that she did get a D on this paper. And that's also going to just add added pressure to Rory. That's not, that's at this point coming from her educator, but also coming from her peers. And then in turn, that pressure is going to be self-inflicted where she's just going to wallow in that bad grade for the rest of the day. Eventually Lorelai picks up on what's wrong, but there's pressure coming from all angles. Yeah. The, uh, the pie <laughs> and then the pencil throwing. It's like, what would you have done if I threw a pen? I would have brought you a fish. What? I don't make the rules. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or no, it's a trout. Specifically it's a trout. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, Luke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a bit of a different read on it because Max does, like, he phrases it in the plural. He says, you know, take these home, learn from them. Rory can't be the only one who kind of performs subpar on this paper. And so I think it was framed that way for the audience for dramatic purposes. But I don't think it was him singling her out. I think it just was a coincidence. Well, a coincidence in the classroom, a very purposeful choice on the part of the cinematographer. 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think other people probably made some errors and have some things to learn from. Um, so I don't think she was necessarily being singled out. And for them to know that she specifically got a D, they would have had to be peeking at her paper. So like, unless one of them is psychic and then they all have a psychic link and one of them sees it and the others can read the mind. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think they looked and they figured it out or they saw the look on her face and knew that it was bad. And then tried to, you know, crane to see. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it is one of those pedagogical techniques to put on that pressure a little bit and say, you know, to air is human. And here at Shelton, we try to beat that humanity right out of you. Right, <laughs> right out of you. That is, that is what happens. That is a technique that they use. A little bit of that sort of <laughs> almost incitement of shame, which is really bad. I don't think that's a really good way to teach kids no. anything, nonetheless, how to succeed academically. So yeah, yeah. Um, I guess that kind of brings us to the next point. It's like, how is Shelton doing at, you know, at educating students and at encouraging the development of psychosocial skills that will actually help them succeed in the world when they graduate? Uh, not always well. Um, and they single out, again, Rory, not, you know, I think obviously because she's our main character, so we need to be focused on her. But we get moments throughout her time at Chilton where the guidance counselors start being um, concerned with her, that she's eating lunch by herself, that she's not socializing enough. Um, they encourage her to try and join more social groups. Uh, way, like a bit down the line, she ends up eating lunch with the Puffs. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, that's a great moment too. Um, but they start becoming concerned with her behavior and that she's not as socially engaged as she should be. Um, it's even something that Charleston noticed when he was interviewing her that she hadn't been joining a lot of clubs at Stars Hollow High. And her excuse, for lack of a better word, was that, you know, oh, well, I joined German club, but then two students left. Um, so yeah. it was just me. <laughs> um, but they're not they're not wrong in saying that she needs to be more social. Um, and I think it's it's right of them to encourage that. But they almost do it a little too forcefully at times um, where it can be more it can be damaging to say like, you need to socialize more because we don't want you to be the way that you are. And in Rory's case, she was very content to just eat lunch by herself and read a book. And there's obviously always something to be gained for socialization, but sometimes wanting to have that time to yourself to do those things is not also wrong. So I think the school does need to do better in terms of what they're recognizing with her um, but it's also worth noting um, that they never really did that with Paris. And she was also kind of in the same boat where she wasn't really a social butterfly either, but they never addressed those concerns with Paris in the way that they did with Rory. Yeah, that's a really good point. I would say that Paris is a little more emotionally unhinged and has more social issues than Rory does. Rory makes excellent points to Charleston when she sort of goes off on him after the whole puff initiation is interrupted. You know, she does mm -hmm. live out of town and they don't understand the full extent of her life. She is, she's got close friends in stars hollow. She has a lot of adult interaction. She has a boyfriend. I mean, she's, she can be a little awkward and you know, maybe the people at Chilton aren't her speed or whatever, but she's not, you know, a hopeless case of the loner with the backpack mm -hmm. and you know, to me, Paris is a lot more concerning now that you mention it. She really struggles with emotional regulation <laughs> and mm -hmm. self-management in that way. And I mean, obviously she's not our main character, so we don't see if she's had similar reckonings with the guidance counselors, but it makes me wonder, you know, what other emotional education and supports might be in place at Shelton for students who are struggling in other areas, you know? <sighs> are they just mandating things across the board and, you know, determining adequate amounts of pro-social behavior and going from there, or are they really individualizing it and helping students who are struggling emotionally? Because, you know, 
in season two, we can see Rory's actually doing quite well. You know, she and Dean are back together. Things are good with her mom and her grandparents. She -hmm. came out, her dad's back. Things are, are going pretty well for her in her life at that point. And so even though she's not a social butterfly at lunchtime, we know she's okay, but Chilton doesn't see it. And so it just, it makes me wonder you know, how one size fits all is their approach and whether that's the right way to be going about it. Like, is there a certain number of things that you have to be doing and a a certain number of friends they see you interact with before they start to intervene? Yeah, I think it's, it's the same policy that you need to take with trying to cater to what any individual child needs in terms of how they're being pressured and what they need in the classroom. It's the same with socialization. There's no one size fits all glove. Some students are going to have two or three friends. Some students are going to have 10 to 15 friends. They both could be socially fulfilled with a different number of friends. And they're both doing perfectly fine within their own friend bubble and well-being. It doesn't mean that one needs help and one is more socially successful. So I think it's wrong to make that determination to say that the number of one's friends or the number of social engagements and how students are interacting constitutes involvement for Roar. I mean, in certain cases, it can constitute involvement if a child is really struggling and that's on guidance counselors and trained professionals to intervene. But in Rory's case, I don't think that was warranted here. Yeah. And I mean, socialization is just the beginning. You know, there's a difference between encouraging people to socialize and actually teaching emotional intelligence and other psychosocial skills that are important for continued success down the line. Like, you know, there's things that need to be taught about self-confidence and Mm -hmm. perseverance and optimism and, you know, mental toughness. And then there's like the moral skills that need to be taught, you know, the sorry, competitive atmosphere Mm -hmm. doesn't maybe necessarily make for the best social environment for kids because, you know, encouraging so much competition doesn't always allow you to empathize with others. And empathy is hugely important. So, you know, what lessons are we teaching kids about this sort of winner take all competitive mentality being what's going to get you to the top Mm -hmm. what what moral skills are being taught to rory and her cohort that are making them actively better people Mm -hmm. yeah and this is pressure too that i think can even start at home with parents Mm -hmm. you know if parents are so rigorous and wanting their child to come home and hit the books and study, 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 and, you know, no television, no internet. It's just all about academia. And you can't go over to your friend's house because you have X, Y, Z that you need to do. This is all pressure that can start at home. And that lack of socialization that the child can end up having can be something that's not even of their own making, but just something that is instituted by their parents' pressure. And that's egregious and even worse. Yeah. And on that note, like, what are the lessons that Lorelai is teaching Rory on that front. She's very hands-off in her parenting. And, you know, she says that she raised her daughter to do whatever she wants as long as that's not hurting anybody else. And Mm -hmm. the school seems to think that's hurting Rory. And obviously they disagree. And to a degree, I think a lot of the audience would probably agree with them because for the most part, Rory can be a little awkward, but is mostly well-adjusted. At least at this point in the show, she had some issues later, which we'll get to. Mm -hmm. Probably in another episode because... We don't have five hours to go into that mess. But, you know, was Lorelai taking an active enough part in sort of like that, the character development and the moral development of Rory if she was so hands off? I'm going to say no, probably not. But I also think it just, again, we can't forget the fact that Lorelai had Rory when she was 16. She was still a child who was growing up herself, having to raise another child. So to what extent are you going to be able to imbibe moral standards and a code of ethics, even that you feel is right, when you're still trying to learn all of these things yourself? You know, Lorelai didn't really reach adulthood until Rory was already in elementary school. And at this point, she's having to find her own way to interact with her peers, 
while her mother is still in her early to mid 20s, there was a lot of this that Rory probably had to learn on her own that Lorelai was not necessarily providing her. And I don't think she was doing it intentionally. I just think that at the same time that Rory was growing up, her mother was still growing up. Yeah, I actually have some theories about that. I have two. The okay. first one is that like sort of as she got older and was reading more, reading a lot of fiction probably taught her a lot of lessons. And maybe mm -hmm. even some nonfiction as well, because I know she, you know, she read Me Lie Massacre, I guess, when she was 12, 11 or 12, you know, the this really heavy book. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that might have widened her, her view and, and given her some perspective, because I know that reading is one of those things that really encourages empathy. And that's probably why she somehow manages to have the skills to deal with someone like Paris. Mm -hmm. even though we've seemingly never seen her accomplish anything like that before. And then my second theory is that because Lorelai was probably working so much when she was really little, she was probably kind of left to her own devices a lot in the inn or left under the yeah. care of others at times to the point where she was kind of allowed to, um, to play and to be creative and to be self-directed and follow her own curiosities. So, you know, there's a lot of benefit in that for kids in allowing them to pursue their intellectual interests from an early age in an age appropriate way, obviously. But, you know, play is really important. And there are a lot of skills that can be learned from play you know, self-control and self-regulation, negotiation skills, um, interpersonal skills, all that kind of stuff can be learned just through like letting kids do things themselves. Like I remember playing a lot when I was a kid and I definitely got some skills out of that. So I think, you know, Rory probably came across a lot of that very naturally when she was young. Mm -hmm. And so when she went to school, she may not have had I mean, no four-year-old really has the skills to walk into a classroom and and just easily make friends and, and fit right in. I think most kids struggle with that. Um, but I think she kind of mm -hmm. went into kindergarten already with a lot of the building blocks for what she needed to genuinely love school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you make an excellent point, too, with her mother working full time as a single parent to, ha to have to support her child, Rory was probably left to her own devices nine out of 10 times, if not even more so. So your socialization skills are going to be something that you're learning as you go. She was probably interacting with more adults at the end than she was with actual children aside from school. So I can absolutely see her entering into that environment and having, I don't know how better to put it, not lackluster but i'll say lackluster social skills as opposed to some of her peers because they had been perhaps raised in an environment even with siblings which rory never had um they had been with other friends establishing play dates we don't get enough here um in this show in terms of seeing how rory what rory's childhood was like in those early formative years to be able to draw definitive conclusions here but just with again, her mother being a teenage parent, it definitely probably did affect her social skills in a lot of ways, which you've already outlined. So I don't know if we can hold any of it against her, nor should we, because she was definitely still a very successful and well-rounded human being. At least until she graduated Chilton. <laughs> yeah. We'll get we'll there. Get, we'll get to her, her college years some other time. I, I really wanted to focus on Chilton yeah. in this episode. Um, and I also want to touch on a lot of other issues about school in general in a future episode as well. But right now I really just wanted to dig into this sort of gifted student stuff, which brings me to the next, you know, major character that we should probably be talking about, which is Paris. Mm -hmm. You know, Paris is, oh, she's something else. She oh, is. she is indeed. She is so driven to succeed. I don't know that any other character in television or film history has ever been quite like Paris. Mm -hmm. um, praise be to Liza Weil, because yes, wonderful character. Uh, she's a little annoying at first, but then like you really start to see her soften up in Concert Interruptus, which is mm -hmm. great. 
Um, and that's when she starts becoming really endearing and you start to understand her a little better. But, you know, she is so eagle eyed on Harvard that I think it, it comes at the detriment of a lot of her own emotional and social needs. And her juxtaposition with Rory makes for some really interesting conflict. Um, and, you know, She's from what ten generations of Gilmore, or sorry, of Gellers of went Gellers to have gone to to Harvard, mm -hmm. and so you know Paris doesn't get that at least not at first, and Rory does. And what does that say about their dynamic and about like about hyper intensive focus on one school or on you know what's more important grades or social activities or well-roundedness like you know she's put so much effort into building her resume from the time she's what 10 or something mm -hmm. and you know but then here comes rory and she just basically walks into harvard <laughs> like yeah what what kind of message does it send that that someone who works as hard as paris and who wants it as as hard as as much as she does doesn't achieve it but rory almost makes it look easy yeah, Rory um, definitely, she didn't have to try necessarily as much as Paris did to succeed. Paris had to put in, She was she's gifted and she's talented and she's smart. There's no denying that. But in a lot of ways, I see Paris having to actually try more and make a more concerted effort to achieve the grades and the results at Chilton and with college admissions that she wants to than Rory does. And this kind of goes back to what we talked about, how there are different types of gifted students. But Rory was just very naturally inclined to succeeding in this way where she didn't have to put forth that same effort. And Paris takes this as a slight when she probably shouldn't, because it's not a slight on you. You are still a remarkable human being. It's just here's another re remarkable human being who's succeeding in a different way and is, you know, we see at the end of the day that uh, Rory is made valedictorian when Paris is not. Um, I don't know what your thoughts there are on should Paris have been valedictorian. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. But there's definitely jealousy there too with this person is so much more successful than I am and it's discouraging to Paris and she lets it affect her own well-being when she can't understand why Rory is receiving all these accolades and she's not, but she's working just as hard. Yeah, she really has a moment of reckoning with that one in season three. And I think, you know, from a meta perspective, I think they obviously didn't send Paris to Harvard because they wanted to keep her in the show. And the only way to do that was to send her to Yale. And, but in that case, like, I think it almost would have been more fair to give, like, if you're going to send Rory to Harvard, Princeton and Yale, <laughs> um, give Paris valedictorian because mm -hmm. You know, she's busted her butt at Chilton for years and has really put in the work, whereas Rory just transferred in early sophomore year. And at least when I changed schools in the middle of my own high school experience, um, you know, I kind of had all the makings for valedictorian. I was the valedictorian in the eighth grade. Um, and then when 12th grade, grade came around, um, I hoped I would be valedictorian again. And, you know, I had good grades. I played sports. I was on clubs and um, student council and all that kind of stuff that, that really put me in the running for it. But it ended up going to a guy who wasn't as academically accomplished as some of the people who, like, really came out on, on top of the class, but who was strong academically and who really lived the values of the school and was a, a real part of the social fabric of the school and who had been there the whole time. And so I completely mm -hmm. understand that. And I think a similar thing might have helped Paris a little bit in, you know, giving her that recognition and giving her that platform to celebrate her own success, even though she didn't get into Harvard. I think it would have been nice for them to sort of split it between them because just handing Rory everything on a platter as if she's perfect and can do no wrong is why Rory goes wrong. <laughs> Yes, agreed. <laughs> oh, there's so much to touch on that down the line too. <laughs> so. Yeah, but I also do kind of love when um, when Paris has that meltdown about Harvard 
mm-hmm. she says that like she wishes her parents had branded her better and maybe sent her to the 92nd Street Y or Brick Church. <laughs> <laughs> and this kind of goes back to the point at the beginning where, you know, if you don't get into one of the baby Ivies, you have no shot at, you know, an elite school mm-hmm. down the line. And I did a little bit of research about this. And tuition, current tuition, I mean, this would obviously be adjusted for inflation going back 20, 30 years or whatever. But um, tuition for Brick, sorry, for 92nd Street Y right now is, it starts at $17,000. And that's for like two days a week of schooling. And they start taking you at the age of two. Uh, Okay. Just sit with that for a minute. You're two and your parents are sending you to this hyper intense adultified school that tries to teach you like you're a teeny tiny adult. And like the fact that Paris is reflecting back on her preschool years and being like, that's where it all started. Um, one is a huge problem in terms of, you know, the pressures we're putting on on kids in kindergarten <laughs> and mm-hmm. sooner. Yeah. And also on the, the financial inequalities of, you know, like, who can afford $17,000 a year for a few days of preschool? Uh, and it, it just sort of reinforces that economic divide where the haves and have-nots are getting vastly different experiences and opportunities. And it just, it boggles my mind that that people do that to their children. <laughs> like, what? Like, you have to go to, you know, an intense open house, and then they have to select you for an interview. And if you get selected from the interview, like, then you make a list. And then if you are yeah. good enough, then you pay out the butt for... <laughs> That came out weird, but you get what I mean. <laughs> I, I do. The ass yeah. For, um, yeah, I'm just going to swear a little bit. I'm sorry. I'm a bit of a potty mouth, but um, yeah, you, That's, you pay no, out the yeah. ass for your mm-hmm. two-year-old to attend school. No, just stop. Don't do it. Yeah, your two-year-old is probably still picking its nose, you know, mm-hmm. on a regular basis, and you're expecting it to succeed and just my child's going to get the best start. And because I enrolled it in this like hoity toity preschool, which I pay, I'm going to use your nomenclature. I pay out the ass for, it just means that my child is destined for Harvard or Yale or Brown or any one of the Ivy league institutions. And when they don't get there, you know, it's almost like what Paris defaulted back to where it's like, Oh, I didn't get it because I didn't go to this preschool. And the parents then say like, we didn't send them to the right institutions growing up. Do you know the damage that you're potentially doing to your child when you're putting that any pressure on from such an early age? They're already they're going to start internalizing that very, very early on. And that can affect emotional, mental well-being, too, with some very serious and dangerous repercussions. And that's an even scarier thing to think about. Yeah, I actually had a thought about this, a bit of a theory. So in the revival, uh, Paris says that she's going to a panel discussion at the 92nd Street Y that's being moderated by Lena Dunham. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder whether Paris is sending her kids to the 92nd Street Y as a way to sort of like fix the past. She couldn't go, but now she wants to send her kids so that they have the opportunities even she didn't have. And it's making me wonder whether her kids are going to kind of fall in her footsteps, which is a huge theme in this show is that, you know, those generational issues and, you know, the circle of life, if you will, where you lead, I will follow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm like, otherwise, why else are you doing a panel discussion at the 92nd Street Y? No, I think she probably was sending her kids there um, as a course correction for the childhood that she did not have, but that she wanted, which we we see the career that Paris has in the revival and the field that she ends up in and she is still a very successful and well-rounded adult. So she did fine in life. She did more than fine. Yeah. She did more than fine in life. So putting this pressure on your own children now, yeah. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree, but you're putting that pressure on for them to essentially follow in your footsteps and to try and be you. And that's also taking away individuality. Yeah. 
makes me think of that scene in the bathroom with Francie where she's like, you know, you are a lawyer and a doctor and I think a certified dental hygienist. Like, mm -hmm. what's your damage? Yeah. That's such a great moment of reckoning. She's like, you know, look at how accomplished you are and you're still so insecure. And I think that kind of leads back to her her not getting her emotional needs met when she was a kid. It was always about her academic achievement and never about her as a person. Her humanity was ignored in the name of, you know, the sort of external financial prestige driven definition of success instead of happiness and fulfillment. And maybe that's part of why her marriage crumbles as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, it just, it goes to show that, you know, helicopter parents and tiger parents who just try to enforce these expectations and these crazy schedules and, you know, don't allow for their kids to just be kids are probably actually doing them more harm in the long run because they're not teaching them mm -hmm. how to cope, how to deal with stress, how to be resilient in the face of difficulty. Yeah, I, I would agree. There's a lot of damage that can be done externally, internally. And I'm admittedly, I'm not a parent. I don't know if I ever will be, but I would hope that if I ever do have a son or a daughter one day, I would not put that kind of pressure on them. It's just the negative repercussions that can stem from it are just things that are too scary for even for me to want to think about. Like, I think there needs to be a greater emphasis on happiness as opposed to what a parent or an educator or any person dictates is success for their child. I think you need to let the child figure that out for themselves and their happiness needs to factor in more. Otherwise it's a very, your child could be skating on very thin ice and there could just be very dangerous and negative repercussions. So, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, I would tend to agree. I think you really need to focus on teaching kids how to find fulfillment and meaning in things and You know, it's it, putting those expectations on them doesn't necessarily allow them to develop intrinsic motivation. They start to tune out their own thoughts and their own feelings because of all these external impositions on them. And it all it becomes all about report cards and grades. And, you know, grades are no longer the gold standard that they used to be. And you know, then you get into standardized testing, which is just a whole other can of worms uh, and has all kinds of problems unto itself. We don't really deal with a ton of that in the show, but, you know, it kind of ties into um, the resources and, and giftedness and needing modifications to educational supports and, and programming. Um, there's been so much focus on developing basic levels of understanding in some subjects that many children struggle with to the detriment of also giving opportunities to gifted students to thrive because, you know, as much as you want to bring the, the standard up a little bit for everyone, you also, if you really want to excel as a country in terms of, you know, producing some of the best minds and having some of the best institutions out there, you know, you have to provide the supports to, the gifted as well, because they're going to be the ones who are going to be innovating and leading. And so all this, you know, no child left behind stuff. I'm a Canadian and even I know that, the, you know, yeah. it's been more or less an abject failure. So mm -hmm. it really needs to be about letting kids direct themselves sometimes and to follow their own passions. Mm -hmm. And I guess that also kind of touches on the idea of multiple intelligences. There's more than one way to be gifted. And so if you let your kids determine their interests and foster their talents within that, that's a better recipe, I think, for long-term success and fulfillment because then it comes from within them. I think Rory to agree, sorry, Rory to a degree has some of that. Um, 
she does seem to genuinely love learning and reading and school and some of the activities she does, especially the paper. But it kind of brings me to a point I was thinking about during your last point about, sorry, I've already lost my train of thought on this. It's okay. But yeah, she, oh, right. Okay. So it's sort of, a lot of the times these expectations come from parents because they want them to fulfill their dreams that they never got to fulfill kind of going back mm -hmm. to the Paris point. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, how much of wanting to go to Harvard was really Rory's idea and how much of it was the expectation or bug planted from Lorelai by, you know, getting her, her first Harvard sweater when she was five, mm -hmm. you know, that, yeah. no five-year-old wants to go to Harvard until their parent tells them what Harvard is and why anyone ever wants to go there you know mm -hmm. so i think that holds true for a lot of kids where they don't care where they go they just want to do what they're interested in but it's all these external pressures that make them that put them on these paths that end up burning them out and stressing them out and just destroying any love for what they were once working toward. Yeah, I agree. Um, transitioning from that, because I think we see a lot of that in the show too, not just with Rory and not just with Paris, but there are other students in the show that go up against some of these same struggles. Um, and I'd like to highlight and talk about some of them too, because I think it's important to touch on those individuals as well. Uh, the first one that I can think of is Jess Mariano. Yeah, he's a really interesting one because, you know, he's got so many similarities to Rory when you think about it. They both have single moms who were teen moms and they both love to read. They're both incredibly intelligent. They have very similar tastes in books and culture, movies, music, but they had very different upbringings. And so mm -hmm. I think that factors into their attitudes towards school. And I think Jess is one of those students who, you know, presumably he comes from a, a lower income background and therefore lacked the resources to be able to get into gifted programs. And even if they had the resources, Liz doesn't strike me as the type to, yeah. to really try to foster that academic um, achievement bug in Jess. So, he probably wasn't encouraged as a kid the way that Rory was. I think Lorelai's parenting style really was a factor in Rory's mm -hmm. decision to pursue the academic path. And, and Jess never had that. And so you get him obviously having the aptitudes to be able to succeed at high school, possibly to graduate early or to, you know, take college credits or anything. But it seems like he was bored at Stars Hollow High, and that's why he just stopped showing up. Yeah, boredom also factors in, too. Um, I'll say, first and foremost, Liz was an apathetic mother, whether she really wanted to be or not, whether or not that was her intention. I'm, she obviously had her own struggles being a single parent and trying to raise Jess. You could even say that she perhaps just didn't even want to be a parent, but she was just thrown into that role and and just had to deal with it almost. But she didn't raise Jess in the same way that Lorelai raised Rory. You make an excellent point there. So parenting definitely factored into how they both approached school. Jess was bored, but he also had no self-drive a lot of the time. He was just very content to skate by, to do the bare minimum. He ends up shirking school to go work and full work full time because money was just more important to him in that moment. And I think it was just, it again, largely stems from not having a parental or adult figure in your life. Who's encouraging you, who's motivating you. Rory was very blessed to have that in Lorelai, but Jess never really got that. And even Luke tried to instill that in him, but I think it was too little too late at that point. Yeah, not only was it too little too late, but it was also forceful. No negotiation. It was just, you have to go to school, and that's yeah. the bottom line. 
And, you know, there was no room for Jess to negotiate or express his desires of what he wanted. And I think, you know, that was a, a huge drawback. Um, what about Logan? Like, would you call Logan gifted? And like, how would you kind of classify him? Speaking of Rory's boyfriends. Um, I, I don't know. Like, I'm going to say Logan is a smart young man. I don't know if I would label him gifted. I think he was privileged and entitled in a lot of ways that youth and teenagers are not. Um, and I'm certainly not trying to diminish his own smarts or anything like that. But I don't think he was gifted so much that he was just handed silver spoons a lot of the time in his life. And he was perhaps, he, well, he definitely was raised in a family that had substantial amounts of money. Um, I see Logan kind of taking the same path in life that Lorelai would have taken had she not gotten pregnant at the age of 16 and become a mother, where you had parents who were willing to spend money to get you into whatever school you wanted to go to, who were going to constantly push you to succeed. I don't know if Emily and Richard would have done that with Lorelai in the same way um, that Logan's parents do with him, but I don't, I wouldn't call him gifted as much as I would say that he was just smart, but pressured and had things handed to him in ways that most people do not. Yeah. I think he had a lot of natural intellect and a lot of resources. There are certain things that make me think that he might have had some giftedness that he tried to tamp down a little bit just because he was so naturally witty in the same ways that Rory was. And, you know, he's very well read. He also got into Yale. I mean, that could be the money thing, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he had a lot going for him on all the fronts and we don't get enough of his younger self to truly know, mm -hmm. but he, he was definitely of at least superior intellect if not truly gifted. And then I guess the last one that we should really touch on quickly is April. Mm -hmm. She's another interesting one. <laughs> yeah, uh, that girl is definitely a go-getter. Um, she will take it upon herself to ensure her own success. It didn't even seem like she needed drive from her mother. She was just, I'm gonna succeed. No one's going to get into my way. Kind of like, uh, I feel like maybe a mini Paris. There is a lot of overlap there with the self-drive. Um, I would almost say more like a mini Rory, just because she seemed a little, maybe socially awkward, but better adjusted, happier, a little more self-driven. Doesn't seem to have as much of that external pressure and like legacy the way Paris did. That's fair. Yeah. But the yeah. self-drive, very apparent. Um takes it upon herself to determine who her own biological father is. I mean, come on. Like, that yeah. girl was succeeding. Um, we do see in the revival that she gets into MIT. Um, and unfortunately, the pressures affect her too. She really struggles in college with anxiety, with a lot of unfulfillment that stems, I think, from that. And she hides it from Luke, but she makes it very clear to Rory that she's facing these things and confides in her um, because I think she sees that Rory has experienced them too. So April is also not um, able to avoid the repercussions of what some of those pressures can be. So Rory, we see, is flailing professionally. She's tap dancing in the middle of the night to, you know, get out her stress and her nervous, anxious energy. We see April struggling. We see Paris still, you know, struggling with her own identity and her own self-confidence. You know, these bright kids who have everything turned into these balls of stress. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what we're doing to our kids if we keep them on a path like we saw depicted at Chilton. And I think mm -hmm. that's sort of the takeaway that Amy was probably trying to get at with this focus on giftedness and academic pursuit and being the golden child and all of those kinds of things, which actually brings me to an interesting point. Like Rory is such a typical golden child mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, 
just the the need to excel and the difficulties drawing boundaries with people, the people pleasing, um, taking on adult roles too soon. And I actually had this sort of theory about Paris and Rory, but like both of them are only children. And so they don't mm -hmm. have siblings and they, I think they almost take the roles of each other's siblings in Ooh. a strange way. I like yeah, that. Sort that's of like that's an interesting one. Yeah. yeah. Thought that I had on Paris's part, especially on Paris's part. I think she sublimates Rory into like her, her sibling role because, you know, it, it almost feels like a sibling rivalry and mm -hmm. she uses her in her own words as a pace car. So there's no one at home except for her, like her parents, aren't treating her as the golden child. They're heaping all these expectations on her, but they're not giving her the validation and the the love that a golden child would typically receive. And so she sort of projects that onto Rory and uses her wow. as this weird stand-in yeah. for a golden child sibling. And it was just such a funny thought that I had about that. But I mean, I guess that kind of might be a good place to leave off because we're we've been going for a while and yeah i think we've covered everything important that we wanted to touch upon this episode um but yeah i will just say in closing i love that last theory i had never really given that any thought but i'm gonna definitely be watching the episodes going forward now just really looking for more of that sibling rivalry how they interact with each other in that way do they behave more like sisters so I think that's an excellent note to end on. Yeah, because you definitely see the love, but you see the competition and mm -hmm. there is a bit of rivalry there. And I think it's like neither of them have siblings. And so there has to be like something that, that takes that spot in their life. I don't know. But yeah, so I guess that's that's kind of where we're at. Um, yeah. Thanks wow. for coming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Um, next week, we will be talking about episodes three and four of season one, Kill Me Now and Dear Hunters. And our focus there will be um, a character study, but just a general and overarching focus on Max Medina and his role in the show, not even just in episodes three and four, but what we see with him from start to finish and all of the episodes that he's in between seasons one, two, and three. So we hope you'll come back and join us for that conversation. Right. We are going to be doing character deep dives at the end of each season, but some of these secondary characters uh, deserve a little bit of time, not so much to delve into their personality and their psyche the way we want to with like Lorelai and Rory and Luke and Jess, but their arcs are still so important to the main characters and the interactions they have are still really worth digging into. So I'm really excited to dig into Max because it's going to be spicy. Yeah, he's not at all problematic. No, not even a little bit. No, no. no but come back for that so you can see us highlight his finer moments, tear him apart for his not so great moments. Uh, we're going to have a lot to say there. So again, we'll hope we hope you'll come back and join us for that. Um, but in the meantime, please check out uh, the two videos that we've already done in the past. Uh, they were mainly just intro videos getting to know us better and detailing a road trip that we took over the summer to Harvard and beyond highlighting a lot of the places in New England that we saw. Um, so please go check that out. And just remember to do all of the regular youtube -y things as you're watching those and this video. Please like this video, subscribe to our channel. And uh, if you want to follow us on social media, there are some other avenues to do that, aren't there? Yes, you can find us on Instagram. We're Gilmore Way Podcast over there. We're at Gilmore Way Pod on Twitter. Or you can send us an email to thegilmoreway at gmail.com. So or leave us a comment. Yeah, uh, we read them, we'll be responsive, and we would love to hear your thoughts on this episode and everything going forward. And we hope you'll continue to join us as we have these chats about the show and other relevant and topic is uh, important issues that we're facing in the world now. Um, but we'll leave that off here. And uh, again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next Friday night for dinner. Bye. Bye. <laughs>